All right, so welcome back. Uh, today we're going to continue the discussion on the American Revolution. Uh, yesterday we kind of talked uh, about the main parts of the war, uh, the process of the war a little bit, kind of the, the, the key or pivotal moments. Uh, today we're going to talk about the end of the war and the establishing the peace afterwards, which is always a difficult process. Remember, uh, we're going to do your chapter five quiz, which is going to be an essay this time, uh, on Friday, and then the uh, packet will also be due on Friday, so uh, be ready for that. All right, so anyway, uh, so where we left off, we talked about the outcomes of the war, the Battle of Yorktown, the three-phase war strategy, how we got to revolution, how we paid for it, all that stuff. So let's talk about winning the war. Now, we talked about last time at the Battle of Yorktown, uh, that that was the final piece of the battle. We cut off the British uh, on, on land, and the French cut them off by sea. The British had nowhere left to go, and we're uh, suddenly in a position where the British can't fight any longer, and we've won the war. So, the question has to be, how did we ever win this war? And it's a valid question. It's a very valid question, because look, the United States of America had no business winning a war against Great Britain, okay? Uh, the British outperformed us in terms of their military strength. They won more battles. They fought more skilled, uh, in a more skilled way. They have more weapons and, and all that stuff. They're more experienced in combat. So the question you really have to say, how do we win this war? All right, and uh, there's a few key factors there. All right, number one, uh, and one of the biggest ones is the fact that they were fighting on our turf. You basically have home field advantage, and that you know, and that sounds you know silly, but it was a big advantage in the war. See, we knew our way around the lands, and I talked uh, yesterday about guerrilla warfare and using kind of that style of fighting, and how that was really beneficial um, to our soldiers. Knowing the lands allowed us to do a lot of sneak attacks on the British. And you do that continually, and you do that often enough, it kind of destroys the will of your opponent. Um, small raiding parties, taking guns and food and thing from, things from the British, um, that worked uh, to our advantage. We knew the land. Uh, we knew how to use the land to our advantage. Okay, And the British never anticipated how well connected the colonies were, like I mentioned yesterday. Um, they had there, there's these these secret roads where the committees of correspondence would pass information, and in doing that would, you know, share uh, stuff with uh, the other colonies. And everybody was so well informed about what was happening in the war effort. It kept the colonies together uh, during this war, and that's a big deal. Another reason, reason number two, why uh, how we won this war. Uh, was because the British just made a lot of mistakes. You know, we talked about that uh, that three-phase war strategy and how um, it all kind of it all kind of failed for the British. So that three-phase war strategy was uh, was a lot of big mistakes. Um, they tried to cut the colonies off, didn't it really work. They thought the fighting was, was restricted only to, or the rebellion was restricted only to the Boston area. It wasn't. They thought there were more loyalist support in the South. These are all mistakes on the part of the British. These are all, oops, these are all mistakes on the part of the British that help us win this war. Okay, so that's a big one. British mistakes. A third reason uh, that we managed to win this war is uh, because... In Britain, during this time, there was a lot of um, a lot of political uncertainty. Uh, you know, the people aren't, aren't too thrilled, as we already know, with King George III, who's proving not to be a very capable leader. Um, there's a lot of division in British Parliament, as there's portions of British Parliament that are kind of supportive of the colonies a little bit. And then there's British portions of British Parliament who really want to go after the colonies, right? If you can imagine uh, the sort of division that exists between Republicans and Democrats in our political system in the United States today, it was probably something very similar 
in Britain at that time. And we see the problems that that causes for us now. Uh, imagine the enhanced problems that it would be if there was a war. So if you could picture that um, system that, you know, the situation that we have now living in Britain during the late 1700s, you can imagine why uh, the political uncertainty there was, was, was a very big deal. And then finally, um, and another one of the big ones uh, was the war was just very unpopular. The war was very unpopular in Britain. A lot of people in Britain viewed it as, you know, the British fighting a war against their own people. And they weren't interested in that. They didn't want that. So the, so the lack of, of popularity for this conflict, for this war, also helps in making it um, just generally a, a, a very... Um, disliked uh, circumstance and uh, look when the when the government is doing something that the people don't like uh, you know it, it's only so long before uh, it's going to just um, before it's just going to, to end right uh, so at the end of the day though and I mentioned this once before it's not so much that the colonists won the war it's really that the British quit okay Again, if we would have continued fighting them, the British military was much better than our military, much more well-equipped, much more experienced, okay? Um, but ultimately, the British quit in the fight and allows us to uh, get, the, get the victory. Two main reasons why the British end up quitting. One, we already said, because of its lack of popularity. The war is very, very unpopular. The king and other powerful members of, of parliament look at it and say, well, you know, we don't want to make the, our people upset. Why are we continuing this fight that's so unpopular that the British people don't want to see going on anymore? See, when kings had a lot of influence and power, being popular with the people was something that was very important to them. So um, King George III certainly doesn't want to be disliked and unpopular with the the British people. So that's one reason why ultimately they'll quit. The other one, which also helps make it more unpopular, is the fact that the war is very expensive. The British are spending a ton of money to come over here to fight this war. The British, not long before then, had been in war with France, the Seven Years' War, um, and the, the French and Indian War. The British are always at war, and by this time in the late 1700s, the people of, of Britain are maybe just tired of it or just tired of war. So ultimately, when Cornwallis gets cornered in Yorktown uh, by, la uh, by land, by the Continental Army, by the U.S., and by sea, by the French, they just got to say to themselves, yeah, is this worth it anymore? Do we really want to keep this going on? And ultimately, they say no, and that's the end. So... The outcome of the war is is decided uh, in something called the Treaty of Paris. Okay, uh, this is where the the British and the French and the Spanish were there too. Too much too long story there, um, and the Americans um, are are there to meet to settle up and determine the terms for the outcome of the war. So this is in September, uh, September of 1783. So the war is coming to a total end now. They're coming to a treaty or a peace agreement to end it. So who are the main people that are there for us? For us. Who are the Americans at the, there to sign the treaty? Three important Americans. Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, and John Jay. Um, all very important people. Uh, figures in the uh, founding fathers and, and, and key figures in early American history. So we send three of our best minds uh, over to kind of handle the treaty uh, for the war effort. Now, the key of these three people, Adams and Jay are legal minds. Benjamin Franklin is just a charismatic and very popular guy, but very intelligent too. But Benjamin Franklin is the key at the Treaty of Paris. Benjamin Franklin is one of the most famous people in the world at this time. Um, he's beloved uh, by the French people uh, and very much actually by a lot of the British too. So it's his skillful leadership and diplomacy that 
that help us in this Treaty of Paris. And ultimately, it results in the U.S. getting a very, very favorable outcome, um, <clears throat> uh, getting a very, very favorable outcome in determining the, the Treaty of Paris. What this outcome includes, uh, the two key outcomes um, are the uh, recognition uh, of the United States as an independent nation, okay? So number one thing there is, is recognition. Recognition by Britain as an independent nation. And number two, so recognition uh, from Britain as an independent nation and a huge piece of new, ter new territory. That's really horribly written, but you expect that by now. So we get recognition as an independent nation, which is what we want. We are now officially the United States of America in the eyes of much of the world. And we get a lot new territory, okay? Uh, basically, all that land from the Appalachian Mountains to the Mississippi River, what we call the continental interior, that now belongs to us. So it's a huge piece of land. And we get this incredibly favorable outcome because of the skilled diplomacy of Franklin, Adams, and Jay, particularly Benjamin Franklin, okay? Uh, he's able to talk to the important people in France and kind of get the things that we want out of this and uh, turns out to be really, really good for the United States. Okay, so this is what we have now. All this, all this is new. Here, let's... All this stuff here, uh, basically, that's all new territory now controlled by the United States. This is disputed territory that uh, is uh, disputed between uh, United States and Spain. That'll ultimately get worked out later, um, and it ends up uh, all good for, uh, for us. These other territories, this gets worked out later. Um, this gets worked out later. That does, too. But uh, So we've added a ton of new land to the United States of America here. All right. So just with anything else, a war has social outcomes. So what are some of the social outcomes for the American Revolution here? So here we're going to talk about women. We'll talk about Native Americans. We'll talk about former slaves. And we'll talk about the loyalists that stayed behind. Okay. As you can probably imagine, the loyalists got it pretty rough. Now, there was anywhere from one fifth to one third of the colonists that actually stayed loyal during the revolution. So you're talking about a lot of people, anywhere from 20 to 30, 30, 33 percent. So it's a 20 to 30 percent, somewhere in there, of all American citizens during the revolution stayed loyal. Okay. Uh, now that the war is over and it turns out that the loyalists picked the wrong side, they're in a pretty rough spot. So what options do they have? Okay. Uh, many of them go back to England. Uh, they could be safe there. You know, the English, uh, you know, they were happy uh, or they, they, they supported England, so they would be welcome back to England. Uh, so some of them go back. Many of them go back. Some of them go north to Canada if they can make it there. Um, but the ones that stayed behind, uh, the ones that stayed behind faced really difficult circumstances. Uh, the loyalists that stayed behind uh, were mistreated, uh, you know, basically treated as traitors now to, to America. Um, they faced basically economic destruction, okay? If you're a loyalist, uh, you know, people aren't going to trade with you now. You're on the losing side. People won't trade with you. People won't do business with you. So those that were stuck or decided to stay back in America had a very, very difficult life. Um, and really kind of unfair to a certain degree. Uh, the colonists, now the patriots or the Americans, whatever you want to call them, uh, they don't like the loyalists at all, and you can understand why. But, uh, you know, they could have been maybe, in hindsight, um, you know, a little bit fairer to them rather than force them into a position where they're just going to face economic ruin. But that's the reality that the loyalists that stay back are forced to deal with. Then, of course, you got to talk about slavery, Okay. Um, so what we see happen is, um, some of the slaves, uh, that uh, are stuck there in the South, um, 
try to escape uh, to England where slavery is already outlawed. So some escape to Britain uh, where they're, they're against slavery and there's, there's not really slavery in Britain specifically. Um, and then in the north, uh, you see kind of the beginning and strengthening of the anti-slavery movement in the north. Okay. Um, so you see that happen. So that's good. So there's more of a movement against the existence of slavery in the north start to happen. While in the south, you have the rationale for slavery is strengthened. Why would that happen? Why would that happen? Because, look, everybody in the south is now saying uh, we need to uh, build ourselves up economically to start to produce now that we're our own, um, you know, that we're our own independent country. Okay. One way to do that is through, of course, slave labor. So that strengthens the rationale for slavery in the South. And it starts to show that divide even more so between the North and the South that we've already seen existing, you know, all the way back, you know, dating back to chapter two, chapter two, chapter three, right? So the earliest colonial days, but now it's going to spread more. While in the North, we begin to see a movement against slavery. In the South, the reasoning for having its existence is strengthened because they say, hey, we really need this now because it's going to strengthen us economically. And if we're going to survive as a nation, we need a strong economy. Another outcome that I didn't put on here, uh, because of loyalists, the loyalists tend to be very Anglican in terms of religion. They disestablished the Anglican Church in the Americas, and as a result, we see the growth of Catholicism a little bit uh, for the first time in a while uh, in, in America. Uh, we name our first Archbishop, uh, Archbishop Charles Carroll, is America's first Archbishop. That's who Carroll High School is named after, uh, the first Archbishop in United States history. So we see actually uh, the strengthening a little bit of Catholicism as well as a result of, of the war. Okay, so Native Americans. Um, obviously, uh, the British being out of America is bad news for Native Americans. Just like in the French and Indian War, when they sided with the French, they choose the wrong side again. And um, basically, um, what ends up happening for, for, the, uh, for the Natives is, because, is more land is taken away from them um, as, you know, you would expect to see in, in this circumstance. So Native Americans lose land, uh, and whites are now going to start moving further over into that continental interior area, taking land away furthermore um, from, from the Natives. Women. Okay, so women uh, during the war, uh, basically, and this is a pattern we're going to see throughout American history, in any war, when the men go off and fight, women generally pick up the roles left behind by the woman, by the women, or left behind by the men, I'm sorry. So women generally pick up the roles left behind by the men. Uh, women start becoming the heads of households. They run family businesses. To a lesser degree, to a lesser degree, we see women get actively involved in the war effort. Most notably, people named, that women that became known as Molly Pitchers. Molly Pitcher was not one woman. It was uh, basically what they called women who would bring out water to troops fighting in the war and in, some ca and, and in some cases actually take up arms against the British. So women uh, played a key role during the war uh, in helping uh, make the war effort successful. But then after the war, um, though there was a push for more women's education, okay, there was a push for education for women, things generally went back to the way they were before. And that's another trend we'll see in American history. Women step up during the war effort, but immediately after the war effort is over, they go back to things being the way they were before. In other words, what we see is a strengthening of patriarchal society, meaning a society that is driven and led by the male figures, a male-dominated society. So our patriarchy is strengthened in the U.S., and female roles are um, even further established in the long run. Uh, one of these ideologies, there's two here, but I didn't have both of them on. One of them is a concept called Republican motherhood. So these two terms I'm going to give you, Republican motherhood here and something called the cult 
of domesticity together are going to be super important eight, um, super important AP point number six. I think we're on six now. Republican motherhood and the cult of domesticity. So Republican motherhood um, is the prevailing thought in the years after the war, and it lasted for a long time, that uh, it was the mother's role, the woman's role to teach their children the ideals of Republican government. Okay, uh, So it was the mother's role to teach their children the ideals of Republican government, of our system of government. So that was the, the role of the mother. Um, their most important role as, as, as mothers, as teachers, was to teach the ideals of, of our government, democracy, Republican government, to their children so they can become uh, good citizens, right? Teach the ideals of Republican government to their children so they can become good and active citizens. What this also creates is something we call the cult of domesticity. Um, basically this idea that because women's role, women's roles are so kept in the home, um, women have very little opportunity to come together and, um, you know, branch out and become more effective and involved members of society. So that is a, a secondary issue that comes with this concept of the cult of, of uh, domesticity. So Republican motherhood, cult of domesticity, uh, two big ideas that uh, are going to really be really, really important and are going to be around largely for the next hundred years or so. These two ideas don't totally become smashed until 1920 when, of course, women get to vote. Okay. So just a little bit left. So our new job now that we've created, now that now that we've won the war, is of course to create a new government, and that new government is called the Articles of Confederation. This is actually the name of the government. It's not simply a document. The Articles of Confederation, just like the Constitution now, was the um, rules with which, and the name of the government which with, with which we existed under. Okay, so how does it work? The Articles of Confederation establishes um, a representative from each state that kind of harkens back to the idea of the Albany plan. Let's have a, have a representative from each state and there would be one person that would be called a president that would reside over um, the 13 representatives from the 13 states. Um, and it would be year-long terms, so they would be kind of like a president of this, like a Speaker of the House type role. Uh, generally, the Articles of Confederation, if you look back at it, is considered a very weak system of government. We're going to find out in, in the next lesson why the Articles of Confederation are so weak. All right, so what powers are granted in the Articles of Confederation? One problem is you're going to find out right away um, is that you know there's very um, very few kind of federal powers that uh, that the government uh, that the government has. Okay, um, basically it's a system where where you have a confederation, right, where power is centered in the hands of the states. So states already let's establish the states have more power in the Articles of Confederation. That's a confederal system. And basically, the federal government, in which there's a Congress that kind of runs it, they only have three real powers. Okay, One is to conduct war. Two is to, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> is to handle foreign relations. Three is to issue money. Those are the real only powers of the federal government under the Articles of Confederation. While the states basically have all the other powers, which include things like making laws, handling trade, 
um, handling a military draft if need be, uh, imposing taxes. You see where it's a problem here? Let's look at those real quick. They make the laws, okay? So the states make the laws and the federal government is supposed to follow those laws, which is the exact opposite of how things are today generally. Um, they're supposed to conduct trade at the state level on their own, but this, the federal government has to handle foreign relations. That doesn't seem to work because trade is part of foreign relations. Uh, the federal, federal government is supposed to conduct war, but the states issue and handle military drafts. That's something else that doesn't seem to make sense. So basically, the, the, the federal government could say we're going to go to war with, with Spain, and half the states could say, well, we don't want to have a draft because we don't want to get involved. And then you've got some real trouble. Um, also, states have the power of taxation, but the federal government has the power to issue money. So how is that going to work? So you can see there's a lot of disjointed issues between the two sides here. They're going to really create um, some serious issues. So sorry, that's kind of written over. So you can see there's a lot of weaknesses of this system, okay? Uh, really, the system is really a rough draft in many ways for what we would ultimately get, what we have today. Um, it is a rough draft, and it's a very weak system. But nonetheless, it's a very revolutionary system and um, helps set the stage for the system that we would create later on, okay? The biggest weakness of the Articles of Confederation, though, is that there's no central authority. There's no president. There's no one person in charge. There's no executive branch. So ultimately, at the end of the day, the states have a lot of power to do or not do whatever they want. And it's going to be a big problem. You don't have a treasury system, so there's no way to really make money at the federal level. Um, it creates a very weak system where state powers are too strong and federal powers are too weak and ultimately it's a system that's going to fail and it's going to fail again because the confederate states during the uh, civil war create a similar system and of course that didn't work out too well for them either okay um, i think that's it that we have for today um so let me know if you have any questions. I hope everything made sense. And please email me if there's something on there that you don't quite understand or something you want to go over more. All right.